This is Dateline Wednesday, February 24th, 1999. Tonight, she's Jane Doe number five. Her allegation of sexual assault is not like any other because her story has been investigated by Ken Starr. Her story has been shown to members of Congress. Her story is that she was sexually assaulted more than 20 years ago by Bill Clinton. All these stories are floating around, uh, different stories of what really happened, of what people think happened, and I was tired of everybody putting their own spin on it. The rumors, the reports, have been making headlines for days. Some of the story told by Jane Doe number five is already out, but not all of it. People are going to look at this and they're going to say, it was 20 years ago. She had all these opportunities to come forward. Why now? Who is she? Does her story make sense? Can she be believed? Quote, Tonight, Lisa Myers with the troubling and puzzling story of Jane Doe number five. Dateline with Jane Pauley and Stone Phillips, plus Tom Brokaw, Katie Couric, and Maria Shriver. From Studio 3B in Rockefeller Center, here is Stone Phillips. Good evening. She became known as Jane Doe No. 5. Her story, well known to independent counsel Ken Starr, to House impeachment managers, to Washington insiders, and to many Capitol Hill reporters. A month ago, she gave an interview to NBC News correspondent Lisa Myers. Since then, NBC News has been carefully investigating the story, combing through state records, court documents and newspapers, cross-checking dates and events, talking to more than 80 people, and repeatedly requesting information from the White House. Then last week, as NBC News continued its investigation, Jane Doe No. 5 went public with her extraordinary allegation that she was sexually assaulted by Bill Clinton 21 years ago. To some, this is an old and unprovable accusation that should never have been circulated to begin with. To others, it's a story that must be told. Is she to be believed? Or is Jane Doe No. 5 the latest weapon in a relentless political war against Bill Clinton? Here's Lisa Myers. It's important to me to tell what happened. I don't know how people are going to take this. I don't know what they're going to think after all these months and years why I've come forward. Jane Doe number five is 56-year-old Juanita Broderick, a successful businesswoman who's been the subject of intense political and media speculation. Rumors about Broderick's story have been floating around Arkansas and Washington for years, known to both Clinton haters and supporters. Broderick was pulled into the Paula Jones case, met with investigators for the House Judiciary Committee, and was interviewed by Ken Starr's investigators. And though what she told Starr remained sealed, it was seen by 40 members of Congress before the impeachment vote in the House. Later, House Republican Whip Tom DeLay publicly urged senators to find out what Jane Doe No. 5 had to say before deciding the fate of the president. As the whispers about her grew, Broderick found herself hounded by the media, and she says the subject of gossip and half-truths on the Internet and in the tabloids. All these stories are floating around, uh, different stories of what really happened of what people think happened, and I was tired of everybody putting their own spin on it. Broderick's story became public last week, and since then her story has appeared in print, on radio, and TV. But much of what you may have read or heard is incomplete. While NBC News was investigating this story and seeking comment from the White House, our work became the subject of much speculation. Tonight you'll see what we were able to learn, and you'll hear from Juanita Broderick herself a woman who remained silent for two decades and who admits she has lied under oath about this story in the past, but now says she wants to tell the truth. Juanita Broderick's story begins in 1978. She was a registered nurse who had started her own nursing home in Van Buren, Arkansas. Bill Clinton was the state attorney general who was running for governor. I believe that people expect me to be ready to be governor if I'm elected. I thought he was just that, something that was really going to be good for Arkansas. Fair. He was a very charismatic man that had bright ideas for our state. And um, I just really liked him. 
Broderick, whose married name at the time was Juanita Hickey, says she was so impressed with Clinton, she volunteered to hand out bumper stickers and signs, her first and only political campaign. Broderick says she met Clinton for the first time when he made a campaign stop at her nursing home in the spring of 1978, when these pictures were taken. While he was there visiting, he said, if you're ever in the Little Rock area, please drop by our campaign office. And he said, well, be sure and call me when you come in. Call down to the campaign office. Broderick says not long after that conversation, she did go to Little Rock for a nursing home meeting held at the Camelot Hotel, now the Doubletree. She says she checked into the hotel and the next morning called Clinton campaign headquarters. She says she was told Clinton was at his apartment and to call him there. I did call and ask him if he was gonna be in the headquarters that day and he said no, that he didn't plan to be there. He says, why don't I just meet you for coffee in the Camelot coffee shop? But Broderick says Clinton called later. She thinks it was around nine in the morning and asked if they could meet in her hotel room because there were reporters in the coffee shop. Did you think his interest in you at the time was personal or professional? I thought it was professional completely. So you thought this was going to be a business meeting? Yes, I did. Yes, I really did. Did you have any qualms at all about him coming to the room? I was a little bit uneasy, but I felt, uh, I felt a real uh, friendship toward this man, and I didn't really feel any, any um, danger in him coming to my room. And uh, I sort of ushered us over to the coffee. I had coffee sitting on a little table over there by the window. And it was a real pretty window view that looked at down at the river. And he came around me and sort of put his arm over my shoulder to point to this little building and said that he was real interested, if he became governor, to restore that little building. And then all of a sudden, he turned me around and started kissing me. And that was a real shock. What did you do? Uh, I first pushed him away. I just told him, no, you know, please don't do that. And I forget, it's been 21 years, Lisa. And I forget exactly what he was saying. It seems like he was making statements that would relate to, well, did you not know why I was coming up here? And I told him at the time, I said, I'm married, and I have other things going on in my life, and, and this is something that I'm not interested in. Had you, that morning, or any other time, given him any reason to believe you might be receptive? No, none. None whatsoever. Then what happens? Then he tries to kiss me again. And the second time he tries to kiss me, he starts biting on my lip. <laughs> Just a minute. He starts to uh, bite on my top lip, and I try to pull away from him. <laughs> And then he forces me down on the bed. And I just was very frightened. And I tried to get away from him, and I told him no. And I didn't want this to happen. But he wouldn't listen to me. Did you resist? Did you tell him to stop? Yes. I told him, please don't. He was such a different person at that moment. He was just a, a vicious, awful person. You said there was a point at which you stopped resisting. Yeah. Why? It was a real panicky, panicky situation. And I was even to the point where I was getting very noisy, you know, yelling, and to, you know, to please stop. But that's when he would press down on my right shoulder and he would uh, bite on my lip. Broderick also says the waist of her skirt and her pantyhose were torn. When everything was over with, and he got up and straightened himself, and I was crying at the moment, and uh, he walks to the door and calmly puts on his sunglasses. And as, before he goes out the door, he says, you better get some ice on that. And then he turned and went out the door. 
on your lip. Yeah. She estimates Clinton was in her room less than 30 minutes. Is there any way at all that Bill Clinton could have thought this was consensual? No, not with what I told him and with how I tried to push him away. It was not consensual. You're saying that Bill Clinton sexually assaulted you, that he raped you? Yes. And you have no, there's no doubt in your mind that that's what happened? No doubt whatsoever. While the president and his lawyer declined to be interviewed on camera, through his lawyer, the president did issue a statement saying any allegation he assaulted Broderick is absolutely false. And when asked about it today at a news conference, the president said he had nothing to add to that statement. It's important to note, and Broderick concedes, that aside from her, there are no witnesses. And as far as we know, no one saw Clinton enter or leave Broderick's room, or even the hotel. She took no photos, kept no evidence, and the hotel has no records to confirm that she stayed there. However, Broderick does have a friend who backs up her story. Norma Kelsey did not want to be interviewed on camera. However, she told us she did accompany Broderick on that business trip to Little Rock. They even shared a hotel room. Norma says when she left that morning, Broderick told her she was planning to see Clinton. But Norma says when she called around lunchtime, Broderick was upset and crying, so she returned to the room. Well, I was very emotional just within an hour or so after it happened. And then by the time Norma got back, my whole top lip it was turned out and very swollen, very ugly looking. Norma also says that Broderick's lip and mouth were badly swollen, that her pantyhose had been ripped off. And she says Broderick told her she had been sexually assaulted by Clinton. Did you feel any internal injuries? Of course, I felt, I felt uh, uh, just, the, just the whole thing you can imagine of being violated. I felt, uh, of course there was pain. Did you consider going to a doctor? No, not at all. I just wanted to get home. I just, uh, I wanted just to all go away. I wanted to just walk out of there and forget that it had never happened because I felt very responsible that I had allowed him to come to my room. Broderick says she decided to leave the hotel immediately without going to the nursing home meeting. She says after Norma helped ice her lip, the two of them left Little Rock and drove more than two hours back to Van Buren. We were still, Lisa, in shock over what had happened. It was like, this is a horrible thing, and I'm gonna wake up in a minute, and this is not going to be true. Norma told us that on the drive back, Broderick was very, very upset and in shock, and says Broderick blamed herself for letting Clinton up to her room. And Broderick says she never considered going to the police, especially since Clinton was the Arkansas Attorney General at the time. The question everyone is going to ask is, Juanita, why didn't you report this? 21 years ago when I it didn't happened. think anyone would believe me in the world. If Juanita Broderick ever wanted to press charges against Bill Clinton, it's too late. The statute of limitations in Arkansas is six years. When we come back, what NBC News has learned about Jane Doe number five and the details of her story. How did her story change? And why is she going public now? From our studios in New York, here is Jane Pauley. How did Juanita Broderick become known as Jane Doe No. 5, deposed in the Paula Jones civil suit against the president, questioned by Ken Starr's investigators? And why did she choose to go public after all this time? Perhaps you have already decided you believe her, or that you don't. But is there any way to prove what she says, or disprove it? Here again is Lisa Myers. Did you tell your husband when you got home? No, my husband never knew. Juanita Broderick says at the time of the alleged sexual assault, her marriage was on the rocks. She says she never told her husband, Gary Hickey, about the alleged incident and told him the swollen lip was the result of an accident. Hickey tells NBC News he doesn't recall either the injury or her explanation. At the time, she was having an affair with the man who would become her second husband, David Broderick to whom she's been married 18 years. 
She says she saw David and told him what happened soon after she returned home. Did she have any visible injuries? Yes. She, uh, her top lip was black. As best you can remember, what did she tell you? I don't remember the words, but that she had been raped by Bill Clinton. Other than her lip, do you remember whether she had any other injuries? Just mentally. She was just bad shape. Roderick also says her affair with David made her even more reluctant to report the incident. I just don't think I would have been a real honorable woman back in the 70s to have been married and been having, in this, having this affair. I just don't think anyone would have believed me. So who else did Broderick talk to? Three of her friends tell NBC News she told them about the alleged incident at the time. Susan Lewis. It was very traumatic for her. Louise Ma. Did you urge her to report it? No. Why not? Because women were made victims at that time. It was always the woman's fault. And Jean Darden, the sister of Norma Kelsey, the woman who says she saw Juanita at the hotel. Both admit they have a serious reason not to like Bill Clinton. In 1981, as governor, Clinton commuted the life sentence of their father's killer, making him eligible for parole. The stories her friends tell from 20 years ago are consistent. And Broderick herself says she recalls many details. For instance, the outfit she was wearing, the hotel room furnishings, and the time of year, spring. However, there is one important thing she does not remember, when the alleged incident happened. Not the date, not even the month. Some people would say, how can you not remember the specific date of an event as traumatic as this? I really don't have an answer for that, except I remember the approximate time of the year and I probably should remember that date, although it's something that I wanted to forget. So NBC News tried to figure out the date of the alleged assault. Broderick gave us access to all the business and personal records she says she could find. We also checked public records, nursing home records, and convention schedules. And indeed, there was a nursing home meeting at the Camelot Hotel in Little Rock on April 25th, 1978. Further, state records show Broderick got credit for a nursing home seminar that was held that day, April 25th. <laughs> so was Bill Clinton even in Little Rock on April 25th, 1978? Despite our repeated requests, the White House would not answer that question and declined to release any information about his schedule. So we checked 45 Arkansas newspapers and talked to a dozen former Clinton staffers. We found no evidence that Clinton had any public appearances on the morning in question. Articles in Arkansas newspapers suggest he was in Little Rock that day. And remember the little building Broderick says Clinton pointed to just before the alleged assault in the hotel room? We checked that too. And in fact, the Pulaski County Jail was visible from rooms facing the river. It has since been demolished. But what happened after the alleged assault? It turns out just three weeks later, Broderick actually attended a Clinton fundraiser with her first husband. Some people would wonder why you would go to a fundraiser for someone who you say sexually assaulted you. Couldn't you have said you were sick or gotten out of it? I think so I was still in denial that time exactly what had happened to me. And I still felt very guilty at that time that it was my fault. By letting him come to the room, I had given him the wrong idea and just shut up and accept your punishment and don't ever do it again. Broderick also told us Clinton called her a half dozen times at the nursing home. She says he got through once and asked her when she was coming back to Little Rock. Her response, she says, I'm not. Then in 1979, a year after the alleged assault, Broderick was named by Clinton to a non-paying position on a state advisory board. Did you have reservations, though, about accepting any appointment by Governor Clinton? Yes, but I had more or less said to the association that I would do this before I knew that it was actually a, government, a governor appointing job. When I agreed to do this, I had no idea it was an appointment. Over the years, Broderick says she had business dealings with the governor's office, but not Clinton personally. 
1984, she received a letter signed by Clinton after her nursing home was named one of the state's best facilities. At the bottom, a handwritten note that says, I admire you very much. A routine political thank you? She interprets it as a thank you for her silence. In 1990, Clinton honored one of the patients at the nursing home, but Broderick says she wasn't there and didn't learn of the visit until after the fact. Broderick says she had no face-to-face -face contact with Clinton until 1991, when she attended a meeting in Little Rock with two friends. They all say it was a nursing home meeting, but none can remember the date, nor do they have any records, so we can't confirm it. Broderick does remember that she was suddenly called out of the meeting, and she says to her surprise, there was Bill Clinton in the hallway. One friend says she saw them talking. And he immediately began this profuse apology, saying, Juanita, I'm so sorry for what I did. Um, he, he would say things like, I'm not the man that I used to be. Can you ever forgive me? What can I do to make this up to you? And I'm standing there in absolute shock. And I told him to go to hell, and I walked off. But Broderick remained silent when she learned soon after that Clinton was making a bid for the Oval Office. Here the man is running for president. Doesn't the country have a right to know this? Yes, and that's what I got to thinking about. And David and I talked about it. We talked about it and I cried about it. And, and then we decided that it wouldn't be in our best interest to do it. In fact, Clinton's political opponents say she rebuffed their efforts to get her to come forward before the 1992 election. After she turned them down, one of the men suggested she had been paid off. Did you receive any payoff to stay silent? Oh, goodness, no. I mean, how could anyone be bribed or paid off for, for something that, uh, to not say anything about something that, that horrible? Did Bill Clinton or anyone near him ever threaten you, try to intimidate you, do anything to keep you silent? No. This has been strictly your choice? Yes. Broderick says she was determined to keep the incident quiet. But in 1997, her hand was forced when she was subpoenaed by Paula Jones' lawyers. She filed an affidavit in that case, under oath as Jane Doe No. 5, denying any unwelcome sexual advances by Clinton. She said these allegations are untrue and there is no truth to the rumors. I didn't want to be forced to testify about the most horrific event of my life. I didn't want to go through it again. She later told the same story, denying the assault, in a sworn deposition in the Jones case. Last March, another woman comes forward, Kathleen Willey, accuses the president of unwanted sexual advances. Why didn't you come forward? I seriously considered it then. I would get up sometimes in the morning and I would think, it's the thing to do, I'm going to do it. Then by nighttime, I think that can bring no good whatsoever to my life. And I'm sorry for these women. I'm sorry for what they went through. But I just wasn't brave enough to do it. There's nothing else to say. But she changed her mind and changed her story when independent counsel Ken Starr's office approached her last April, investigating wrongdoing in the Jones case. Broderick says she feared lying to a federal grand jury. And once Starr granted her immunity from prosecution for perjury, she agreed to come forward with details of her allegations against Clinton. But Starr did not pursue the allegations further because he was investigating obstruction of justice charges against the president. Broderick never alleged any obstruction, said the president never urged her to lie. Finally, after months of contact with us, Broderick decided to speak to NBC News on January 20th in the middle of the Senate impeachment trial. Why now, Juanita? I just couldn't hold it in any longer. I didn't want granddaughters and nieces, when they're 21 years old, to turn to me and say, why didn't you tell what this man did to you? We repeatedly asked the White House what it knew about Juanita Broderick, about her character or possible motivation. We got no response. We checked with local and federal law enforcement officials who told us she's a solid citizen with no criminal record and that they take her allegations seriously. 
Roderick knows that some people have suggested her injuries 21 years ago were inflicted not by Clinton, but by her first husband, Gary Hickey. Divorce papers obtained by NBC News show that one year after the alleged assault by Clinton, Juanita and Hickey had an altercation. She says Hickey struck her in the mouth. He told NBC News it was an accident. Roderick says that is the only time her husband hit her, and there are no records of an earlier incident. Could Broderick have a financial motive? Is she hoping to cash in? She says she and her husband are financially comfortable, have turned down an offer to tell her story for money, and have no plans for anything else. No book deal? No book deal. No Absolutely lawsuit. not. I have no desire to, to uh, sue Bill Clinton. I have no desire to write a book. Finally, did Broderick have any other motivation for going public now with her allegations? Were politics behind the decision? Broderick's personal attorney is a Republican state senator in Arkansas, but he says he did not know she decided to go public until after she agreed to talk to NBC. Broderick says she is not registered with any political party, and the Brodericks say they have donated money to both Republican and Democratic candidates. What is the purpose? Do you want to destroy the president? No, I don't want to do anything. I do not have an agenda. I want to put all of these rumors to rest. I buried this a long time ago, Lisa. And the only thing I'm trying to do right now is to clear up all of these stories that are out there. But after all this time, how does Juanita Broderick feel about Bill Clinton? I couldn't say it on the air. My hatred for him is overwhelming. Overwhelming enough to invent a story, to distort a memory, all to destroy a presidency? Absolutely not, she says. 20 years after it happened, having never reported it to authorities, after signing an affidavit denying anything ever happened, you now come forward. Can you understand how skeptical people may be? Certainly I can. But I was also afraid of what would happen to me if I came forward. I was afraid that I would be destroyed like so many of the other women have been. Do you understand the enormity of what you're saying to him and to you? Yes, I do. It's been a hard, long, uphill battle to make these statements. But I just, I feel like I have to. I feel like I have to make these statements now. So now there is a face, a voice, a name for Jane Doe number five. Her story, just the rumor of it, has influenced politics and journalism, opened up her own life to public scrutiny, and cast yet another shadow over the president, who denies the charge. In the end, the questions remain. Was it sexual assault? Could it have been consensual sex? Did anything happen at all? We may never know, and that may be the unsatisfying ending to the story of Jane Doe number five. What won't end is the debate over whether Juanita Broderick's story is true, whether it has any political relevance, and whether the media, including NBC News, should have reported it. Much more on that, including viewer comments, later tonight on Hockenberry on MSNBC and on the internet at msnbc.com.